So, thanks for the introduction. My name is Anton Sundqvist. If someone could look at the picture, I think I have connected everything. It should be... Oh, there we, did. there we go. So, yeah, I recently moved back to, to Finland and I have my small consultancy business there where I do typical N-Lite system integration stuff. I'm also an N-Lite partner and I'm uh, doing a lot of this unit testing as a part of my daily job. So, my thought here is really that I would come here and share some of my experiences and some of my lessons which I have learned uh, through doing this uh, in the real world. Um, so, to give some kind of uh, overview of the agenda, what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to be introducing the idea of test-driven development and design. This has been touched upon in the few presentations we had today already. Um, I'm also going to share some of my experiences with it in the, the real world. and. Uh, show some, some examples. They might be uh, simplified, but they are still uh, uh, real-world examples which I have uh, come across, and we're going to spend a lot of time on those. Uh, there are, of course, some challenges with testing, and uh, there is a lot of pushback when I talk with people in the LabVIEW world about uh, doing this kind of test-driven development style uh, development in LabVIEW. And uh, there's a lot of myths that you can't do it in LabVIEW and uh, that it's uh, very difficult and stuff like that. And I want to try to bust that myth or at least challenge it a bit. And then we can later maybe have a beer and fight over it afterwards if we, have, if we can sort it out during these 45 minutes here. I'll be staying until tomorrow if someone takes the invite. And anything that I show here will be available on this GitHub. I can throw it in the Discord so, Discord, so you don't need to, to type it. But uh, the code, uh, presentation, everything uh, will be there. So, uh, before we go into the, the actual topic, just to set the scene, let's uh, quickly uh, define or try to define what software quality means. So, in a very simplistic way of talking about it, we want the software to do what the user expects it to do, right? And uh, on the other hand, we want it to be easy to change. And this can be described in many different frameworks and we have principles and guidelines and uh, things like coupling and solid principles and cohesion. Uh, but all comes down really to being up to the northeast of this graph. So just when I, when I say that something is better, I will tend to mean that it's, it's further up there. That's what I, would, what I will mean uh, later. So, how can we get there? How can we deliver high-quality code at a higher, place, how, how, higher pace? Uh, we only have a limited time a day to, to do our work, and we uh, need to make the most out of it. Um, there are many, many tools we can use. We can do scripting. We can do all kinds of stuff. But the only thing that I have found which actually works, uh, or works somewhat, is to, not, to minimize the, the, the mess you make while you develop. To, to not to make it slow you down later. So the only way to go fast is to not make a mess while, while going. And I think this is, in a, every case, more or less true. And just to try to explain why this is, this is taken from Martin Fowler's blog. Uh, the idea is that as a software system grows uh, in size, in scope, in complexity, it gets more difficult to add to it. And uh, uh, and the, the lower the internal quality of the system, the, the slower it will get over time. And the idea is that we, of course, want to improve the quality, and by that we will be able to deliver faster uh, and better code. And uh, um, test-driven development has been the best tool I have found so far that actually helps doing this. And uh, the interesting point here is then, where, where is this break-even point? how much effort do we need to, to put in to all this testing before it starts to, to pay off. And my argument is that this is measured in, in hours, uh, not, not days or weeks or months. It's very quickly when you start to get, get uh, uh, the benefits out of it. And I'll try to, to, to show why this is. So uh, let's talk about test-driven development. How many of you uh, test your code? Yeah, expect everyone to test your code before releasing it to the customers or to production. That's good, of course. How many of you do automated testing? That's a lot of you. Good, good. Uh, so you might not be too difficult to, to convince that this is a, a good idea then. Test-driven development is, uh, 
it's a <laughs> that's part of it. But there's also so it's a really a, a discipline or a way of working, a workflow process uh, where we start always by writing a test before we start writing the production code. We we write a test for the code. Uh, and of course it will fail because we don't have the, the code in place. So we, we try to test the behavior which we are about to create. And when we have that test in place, then we see it fail and then we start to, to develop uh, code to, to make the, pass, the, the test pass. When we have gotten so far, then we can do all, uh, make it all nicer, we can refactor it, we can uh, apply, apply patterns and we can uh, do, improve on the design. Uh, clean up our mess, but the idea is to, to quickly get it passing and then we, we make it nice afterwards, all the time keeping everything passing. So we get into this kind of cycle where we have a red phase where the test, we write the test and it fails, we go into the green phase where we just make the test pass, we don't care too much about how it passes, and then we remove the duplication and clean up and that's what we do in the refactor stage, and then we start over. And it's very important that for this to work well, I found that this needs to be a very, very fast iteration. So typically I do this in cycle time, so in, measured in minutes. So it's nothing long, and you only do one test at a time. You don't write a lot of tests and then try to fill it in afterwards. Uh, only one test at a time um, is what I have found worked best. And if someone here hasn't ever seen this kind of workflow, how, how it would look like, I did record a YouTube video, which I put up yesterday or so, uh, where, where uh, I developed Snake using this, uh, this method. So if you don't know what it looks like, this might be a good, a good uh, source to have a look at, because I won't be able to, to show anything, any live coding during this presentation. Um, and importantly, writing tests now, they, it becomes an integral part of the development, so you can't really separate the two of them. You can say that writing tests take this amount of time and then the coding takes this amount of time. It's really the same because a lot of the design happens during the, the when you write the test because then you need to, to think about how is the code going to be used. And this is important, of course. So it's a, a bit of extra work, of course. You need to you need to write test code. Uh, the tests are typically simple. Um, they should be very straightforward, very easy to read. Um, so, and they tend to be quite, what's happened there? Repetitive. Um, but anyway, it's gonna add more to your list of chores to do. So why should you even bother with this? And uh, of course, I'm convinced that there's a huge value with it. I think first, first and foremost, it improves the design. And it improves it directly, and I will, in a minute, just try, try to show you how it does so. Um, of course, you get the self-testing code. <laughs> and I can't stress enough how, how ni nice it is to have the, have the, the suite of unit tests, as James uh, said, talked about earlier, uh, which will give you somewhat higher confidence that what you have uh, is working. Of course, it won't replace an end-to-end system level test. You will need to test with real hardware and make sure that the system works. But it's very nice to have uh, to, to know that the code works as you intended it to do. And this reduces the stress because I can, easy, I can add features to my code base and I can run my test suite and it's still green. That means that, yeah, I probably didn't break any behavior I intended to put in there before, because I followed this process and everything I have intentionally put in there, I have a test for. So if I, so, so if I, I break something, uh, then I need to look into to what, what happened there. Um, last point here is uh, regarding documentation. So this is a, in a very different sense to what Olivier um, described with uh, making nice documents for for a customer or someone learning about the system. This is more for a developer. When I pick up a, uh, something from the tools network or something, um, if there's code examples, this is very useful to see what, how the code actually is supposed to be used and how it works. And uh, the good thing with this is because the tests pass, this is actually what the code does. It's not what someone wrote that the code does or how it was supposed to do. It's, it's uh, the code. Uh, it's the actual code, which is the, the truth of the system. Good, so this should be enough motivation to at least consider uh, employing this kind of uh, workflow. So, uh, I mentioned that uh, 
writing the test first, this actually puts a kind of design pressure on us because we really need to think about how the code is used. And uh, it, also, uh, um, it also comes down to this. Uh, what makes the code testable? So for code to be testable, it has to have some certain uh, features. So for one, it can't, it can't be tightly coupled to, to a lot of other modules. So if the, the code is tightly coupled, then when you want to test that code, then you pull in the whole rest of the world into the, the test. And that's not what you want to have. It will make the testing very difficult for you. So this is the, the process of writing the test, telling you that there is something wrong with your design. The code is too tightly coupled. I should do something about that. Uh, and there are, of course, solutions we can employ then to, to cut those couplings. Um, APIs tend to become clearer. You don't add a lot of stuff that you might need later because you do the minimal amount of work necessary to create the API. So the APIs tend to, to be a lot, of cl lot clearer. And uh, it's also, yeah, again, from the perspective of documentation, having the clear API in a test, minimal test showing the happy path through the program uh, or through the, the class, how it's supposed to be working, the unit of code which you are testing. Uh, it uh, uh, yeah, tend to, to work out this way for me. Um, you also need to consider your dependencies. So what do you depend on? Um, so what other modules in the system do you pull in when you, when you test it? And you need to do that kind of explicitly. Um, and I would argue that that's a good thing then to, to have under control. Um, the responsibility of the module of code which you are trying to test, the unit of code under test, needs to be limited, it should be, it should not be doing this and that and that and that, because then you will have tests checking this and that and then doing all these other stuff. Um, typically that makes your testing difficult and that tells you that there's something wrong with your design. Maybe split it up into two different uh, libraries, classes, what have you. Um, and also, last point is that uh, if the code has a lot of side effects, if you use mutable global state, if you uh, um, do something that is not passed in or extracted out of the of the VI on the test, then uh, the testing will be more difficult and that will tend to nudge you in the way of using less of these uh, things and this in turn will make the system easier to, to reason about because these side effects are very nasty to reason about. Uh, so as long as possible I would try to avoid them. So the question then is what if we started to write a test, what if we start with writing the test? Well. Of course, we would try to not make our lives too difficult, so we would make the, the, the process of writing the test as easy as possible, and that would in turn more or less force us to get all of these benefits, right? Because else we create something that's difficult to test, and that's, yeah, we, we tend to be lazy. So I mentioned that I, um, that I perceived that doing that, that working in this way is uh, actually driving my design in a positive way. It's improving my design uh, according to the metrics I had in the beginning. And I'm going to just show you a concrete example. This is uh, a mundane task, uh, creating something that parses barcodes. Uh, I'm sure that most of us have done it at one point or another. And uh, you could probably just wing it together. Um, I had the task a while back. Uh, there was some barcode format. This is, of course, a toy example of that barcode form format, but the idea is the same. We have some kind of identifier, then we have a content, another identifier, and some other content, and we want to parse out that. So how would you go implement this? Yeah, that's the wrong question. How would, would we go about testing this? That's what we should be asking ourselves at this point. So um, I started with something like this. So I need to have the date and the serial number out of it, but I start with the, the easiest thing I can reason about, and that's getting the serial number out. So I created a class for it, not because I intended to do anything fancy with object-oriented design. I just thought that yeah, using a class is a convenient way of yeah, getting a cohesive unit to contain my code. So I created a class. Uh, I created a constructor for the class, which takes in the, the string from the barcode. Uh, that's that one. And then I have some kind of method to, to get the serial number out. 
And at this point, these are just empty BIs, uh, but we need to work with something. Uh, we need to have some kind of code which we can write the test from. In te text-based languages, you would typically write methods that don't exist yet, but in LabVIEW, that's a bit difficult, so you need to create the BIs and then uh, smash them in here. Uh, this small VI here, this actually belongs with the test case. Um, it's a helper method. This is a convenience pattern I tend to fall back on quite often. And when, when uh, we use this kind of standard inputs to, to constructor and stu constructors and stuff like that, uh, it's a good idea to create a, a small helper VI just to, to do that. Because when we then have 10 different tests having the same parameters and we change the, uh, what, what the parameters are later on, then we don't need to change it to more than one place. Um, so yeah, this is quite straightforward. Um, now I have a test with tests that I can read the serial number from this simple barcode. So I won't even show the implementation of that one. And I can create the, the same kind of test for, uh, for a date. And yeah, this is actually the same helper VI. It just have, has a separate input, input here and they are not required. They are recommended or optional. Um, so yeah, we have the two tests. We make it pass. Easy as that. You could probably have uh, saved a few minutes or so if you just coded it up uh, directly. Uh, but I stuck with, with the process here and I went through the exercise of writing the tests first. And I end up with a quite clean, clean API. So what happens next? Um, well, it works, works well, but then um, I realized that, yeah, there is actually a different format I need to handle. And this is when we start thinking, yeah, how, should I just add it in here? Should I just uh, extend on my code and... Uh, put it in, in there. And then, then we have all these principles that we learn about, about single responsibilities and uh, how we should not do more than one thing with, with the class. So um, I put on my, yeah, so this is my other toy example. It's an XML formatted string, which we need to parse for the same, same content. Uh, so I put on my, my designer hat and uh, deci decided to let's extract a parent class for the barcode and then we have this type a which was the first type um, as a subclass of that one and this i can do very <coughs> effectively now because now i have the test coverage for uh, test testing all the behavior i have created i have of course a bit more tests than what i showed but everything is tested so it's very easy to refactor this to pull out a, a parent class of it and uh, to, to change it, and all the time I keep the test green, right? Um, so this is all of what uh, James said earlier about making the change easy and then making the easy change. So now when I have pulled out the, the parent class, then I can go ahead, uh, okay, yeah, let's look at this one first. So this is the, the constructor now. I decided to change it in this way, so I, uh, instead of uh, uh, keeping it with, with type, uh, with type A, uh, I move the constructor up to the barcode class, and uh, then when I get the dollar sign, then I want to get a type A out of it. So uh, you probably reckon, recognize the factory pattern here, but uh, I didn't intend to use it. It just fell out of the design process here because I had uh, had this uh, this process. And uh, also, I never planned to make subclasses in the beginning. You could have plugged them in and make the hooks in the beginning to, to do all of the, that stuff, but I, I realized at only at this point that I was going to need it. So up until this point, the code was very clear. Then I needed more complexity, so I added it when, when needed. So we can easily add another subclass here, and we can add to this uh, create method another case here, which then throws out the, the other uh, barcode parser, the type B. So pretty straightforward. We have uh, something that looks like this. Now we have uh, the parent class and then we have two types A and types B. And at this point I recognize that I can even make these private because there's no need for the user to be able to access those directly. So they are in a library so I make them private to the library and they can be created using the factory method. So the design just fell out of it. Uh, I didn't plan for it in the beginning and this is kind of what I'm trying to get at with, with this design process, starting with the tests, thinking about how you're going to use it, it tends, uh, and not doing more than you need at the moment, it tends to come out uh, very nicely in the end for some reason. Uh, and I think it falls back to all these uh, things about why code is testable and why not. So just briefly, looking at the tests which we have here, so we, we have a test for type A, then we have this helper method which creates a barcode of a type A, and for type B we have 
the helper method creating a barcode of type B. But the interface is exactly the same. We call the same methods. They are all the abstract parent class, which then delegates to, to those uh, uh, child classes when they are actually called. But this is a nice API for the user. Um, maybe a simple case, maybe it's too simple, uh, but I hope that you see that it uh, adds. Uh, there is a reason for, for, for doing this. So you say, this all sounds good, but what about all my instrumentation? What about uh, my communication buses? I use Khan and serial communication, and I have user interfaces and command line and uh, databases reports, uh, all kinds of thing, things that makes my life more difficult, and, and I can just test this, right? So, yeah, uh, these are all more or less I.O., and uh, I think that these belongs on the edges of the system, interfacing with the real world, and then the, what we call like the, the business logic, as James called it yesterday, um, is the core of the application which, should, which uh, we are interested in testing. Um, and in, in LabVIEW, we tend to use a lot of ha hardware. So in that, uh, in that sense, we might be different than, well, people working with JavaScript or, or other languages. But I, I, I would argue that we are not as different as we would like to think, because IO is present in all kinds of applications. Uh, and uh, working with it is not that different in LabVIEW than in any other case, in any, any other case of uh, IO. So uh, what about testing at the edges of a system? What about testing when we have these kind of uh, nasty things like instruments uh, present? So there's one very simple rule. When something makes uh, testing difficult, we try to get rid of the things which makes the testing difficult, right? Uh, I think it's best to, to take this uh, with an example. So uh, let's look at a small class for interfacing with a power supply. You've probably made stuff like this before. It shouldn't be um, a surprise how this is implemented. We open a visa reference, we write to it, we make a query, right, and then we read something back, and then we can close it later. So this is not easy to test, and the reason is, of course, that we are writing stuff to a serial bus, and in order to test that, we would ha need to ho hook something up to the serial bus and capture what's written there. So this whole visa business makes our lives very difficult here. And uh, this was not developed using a test first approach. Uh, and well, I wouldn't go and retrofit tests to it. But uh, the thing that makes this difficult is that we have the visa in there. So what if we tried to develop the same kind of code using test driven development? Uh, well, writing the test first would force us to think about how we access the, the serial port. And we really would need to pull out Visa from this uh, uh, design. So what we can do is we can create an abstraction. This is what we do when we want to decouple stuff. We create abstractions. So uh, interfaces are very nice. Uh, use them over abstract classes when, when applicable. Uh, and uh, really, if we looked at what we had here, so we are looking to create something like this. Uh, our the, the thing that we are adding to this system, the thing that we, are, we care about is really, uh, well, in this case, it's how we format the output and that the correct output is sent when we do the correct commands. That is what we are inter interested in testing. So we need to have a read and a write method. And then we can, of course, implement the full visa driver <laughs> with those two methods later. But uh, for the purpose of testing this PSU class, we only need these two methods, read and write. That's what we care about. Um, the front panels, of course, are pretty simple. And this, at this point, in order to test, OK, so we, we have an abstraction. We have the visa implementation. But in order to test it, we need something more. We need to in somehow, uh, somehow trick the code which we are testing that we have something more, uh, that we have, uh, to trick it that there's something more there. And we can do this with uh, using a fake object. So we can create something called a mock instrument in this case. Uh, we could, uh, for example, use a string to give a response. So whenever you read from the mock instrument, you would get the same response. You could do something more complex, but I tend to start with the most simple solution. Uh, when something is written to the mock, we want to be able to spy on that to read out what was written to the mock, because this is what we, are wanna, we want to test later. So uh, for this, I tend to use a queue. 
So we create the mock, we initialize a queue, and we add something to respond string. Uh, pretty simple code. It's very easy to mock stuff in LabVIEW, and this is a, a actual kind of uh, important. It's very easy to mock stuff in LabVIEW. Uh, it was much more difficult when I tried to do the same in C++. Uh, we can read the responses like this. So this would be the read method of the mock. It just gives out the response. When we write to the mock, we enqueue stuff to the queue. Um, and the queue behaves more or less as a serial bus, so in that um, we could add more uh, like uh, end characters and termination characters if we wanted to. But let's keep it simple for now. We also have this testing method, which is called uh, spy uh, on the, what is it called? Uh, spy write data in this case. Yeah, so we can dequeue from the queue. And this is what we can use in the tests to check that the correct thing was written to the mock. Right, so now we can start writing our tests. So before writing any of the, the code for the PSU, we can write a test like this, oh, like this. So we initialize the PSU, we feed it the mock as a parameter, then we write 13 volt to the PSU and we expect it to write this to the bus. At this point, we don't care about how it's sent to the instrument, we just need to, uh, to know that the, the, the PSU class writes this to the, to the instrument interface, right. Uh, and of course, you could add more more tests to this to check all the other behaviors. But you can go and check on GitHub if you are interested or if you can follow. One thing that changed here now is that the constructor which we have actually takes an object as a parameter or it's actually an interface there. Uh, it takes an object, but it's defined by the interface. Uh, so when we then want to use the, the class in the real world, we would need to put in uh, the actual uh, serial interface there. So this is what it looked like in the first example, which had everything, at the lo which has responsibility for both communicating with the instrument and formatting the strings. And now we pulled it out. So we have one class which is com uh, responsible for communicating with the instrument and one which is uh, responsible for, for formatting what, what is being communicated. So we have single responsibility between these two classes. In my uh, opinion, it's a better design. But it gets a bit messy here, because we first need to create this one and then feed, this, feed it into there. And for the user, we might want to then create just a wrapper around this to make it look like this for the user. But it, in the actual code, it will do this. Um, it's not necessary, but it's, uh, it's good to hide the implementation. So that was our low-level hardware example. Uh, so we had a. Uh, power supply, we split it up out into two different classes. So we have the PSU class, which then uses the interface. And then we had two different implementations of the interface. We had the mock and the, the real visa. And uh, this is a general ID that we have when we want to use this kind of fake objects or test doubles. So we have some kind of abstract interface, abstract class, uh, which we can then implement with the actual implementation in production. And when we want to test the code we're developing, uh, in kind of isolation, we can create a test double. And in more in sophisticated cases, it can be a, this kind of mock which has a queue you can write to, but it could also be something that's just stubbing out the, the stuff so that you can run the tests. Uh, and the important thing here is that we actually draw these kind of boundaries in the system where all the dependencies point in one direction. So in this way, we can actually separate how uh, the dependencies flow and we can invert it in, in uh, the, the direct opposite direction of the control flow in the applications. And this is very powerful for managing the dependencies in the, in the system. And it also gives us a lot of flexibility, because if we didn't want to use Visa anymore, if we wanted to use something else, so we could just change how we write to the instrument. And all the instrument-specific code is still the same. So we have only a single point of change. So we had this, uh, this construct where we put the mock, no, the, the object in a uh, parameter. This is called dependency injection. Um, you have some kind of dependency which we want to feed to a class. And you can do it in the constructor or as a setter method. Typically, if it's required for the, the object to work, you would do it in, the, in a constructor-like way. And for optional stuff, decorative pattern stuff, you could do it like that. So, but most of you probably don't work with very low-level drivers all the time. That's, in many cases, we have higher-level stuff. So what if we have a driver like DAC MX, or if we have something like this uh, Keysight uh, PSU? 
and that we want to work with. Uh, should we then go and mock out the visa there to test that it works? And of course not, we, sh we shouldn't. So in, in general, we should not test code which we do not own. We only care about that our code works, and if someone else's code don't work, then of course it's a problem for us, but that's not what we are writing the tests <laughs> for in this case. So, uh, so I think, still think that this uh, method of test-driven development is very applicable to the cases where we have something more high level. It's just that the level of abstraction is a bit higher. So what if we wanted to make a, a voltage ramp with the PSU? So we wanted to ramp up the voltage in a nice linear fashion, uh, and we want to make sure that this works. So uh, we want to write some kind of tests for it. Um, we can actually use the same kind of patterns. We create an interface. We can call it a voltage uh, output because that's what we eventually want to do. We want to output a voltage, and then we create our mock instrument for it, right? So it's the same all over again, but at a higher level of ab abstraction. And again, we draw these boundaries in our system, which tend to help with uh, managing the design. So at this point, we can start writing tests like so. So we can have the mock voltage output which we feed into the constructor and then we can check for example in this case that when we generate the ramp we get 11 data points when we take a step size of 0 0.1 volt between 0 and 1. Uh, these are the kind of errors that you easily do as a programmer you tend to forget the endpoints in a range for example boolean logic all these kind of stuff is good to have checks on. Uh, similarly we can check that it ends on the correct uh, voltage and it starts on the correct voltage. And these were added as the code was developed, so uh, all these tests first fail, then I, do, I, I made the, the least amount of work to make them pass, and then I went on to the next test. Right. Uh, this is uh, a bit of a sketchy one. You can test timing. Uh, I, would be, I would be a bit hesitant to do so. I did here just to check that it actually uh, times well. For this test, I didn't really care what was outputted to the voltage output, so I just fed in this uh, empty interface uh, null object uh, to, the, to the class. It still works without it, it just doesn't anything. And then I can check the timing uh, using something like this. Uh, this is useful for development, but it might become flaky if you run it in a CI environment when you have multiple threads, and if you run the tests in parallel, stuff like that, it, uh, the, the sequencing might impact the timing. So, uh, yeah, I would be okay with skipping this. Uh, just add an underscore before the test case, uh, test uh, BI, uh, and it will not run then uh, in the CI system if it becomes flaky. Just as a side, side note here. So, at this point, we have ramp voltage, uh, which is what we were out to, de to develop. We created an interface to uh, generate a voltage. Uh, voltage output, we called it, and now we can implement it using those high-level high PSU drivers. And the nice thing, thing here is that because we designed it in this way, uh, just because we wrote the tests first, now we now, now we shall have a design which is more flexible, because we can also add, for example, a DAC here, and it doesn't really make any difference for the, the user, the, the ramp voltage uh, class, if it's a DAC which is doing the actual output or if it's a PSU. Uh, it will behave the same. So this is another example how this process actually improves the design, because I wouldn't have done it in this way without the test first approach. right? And also when I created this example, at this point I looked at it and were like, yeah, this is actually more gener generic uh, than I thought, and we can actually make it even more abstract. We can just call it a ramp and have an output. And then we could add whatever to the output. We could make a current ramp, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, these kind of things just tend to fall out when you work this way, and uh, if you haven't tried it, I would recommend at least give it a go. Cool. So, another objection, and this is maybe a more difficult one, is uh, legacy code. Um, so how do we test something which we already have? Um, and maybe start with some kind of definition of what legacy code is. And I'm just going to steal Michael Feathers' uh, definition here because it uh, resonates with me. Uh, Michael Feathers, is, uh, he, he wrote the book, Working Effectively, Effectively with Legacy Code. It's a very good read, uh, a very technical book uh, on working. Uh, really, it, it all, it's all about getting the code under test uh, with, with minimal risk. Because the problem is that when we, when we want to change legacy code, 
uh, or code without tests. We typically need to make uh, changes to get the, the tests in place. Right. So this is, in, in its own is, is uh, risky. So, yeah, not to give you any uh, like golden bullets here or something, silver bullets, I think they, they are called. <laughs> I just, uh, ju just want to share what have worked for me. So I have a, a project. So all these unit tests earlier were developed using LUnit framework. It's an open source framework. It's very much like VI tester. Um, and uh, for that project, I actually first started writing it without test-driven development. And when I decided to make it open source, I was a bit shamed. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have any tests in place, so I, I didn't really feel like releasing it. But uh, that's a good. Uh, well, maybe case study. I started when I, whenever I needed to add new code to it, I started tests first. That worked very well, and the code that fell out of that was actually better than what what it would have been else. Um, and then I can plug that in to my uh, legacy system. Also, like uh, uh, yeah. So whenever, so yeah, can I add the test? We, I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't say that you should go and just uh, hook up a lot of tests to your, your existing system because it's really not going to give you much in the sense of value and uh, you might not even test that it actually works. It, um, it's very difficult to, to put place, uh, tests in place afterwards. Um, and uh, what has worked for me then is to, when I, whenever I do a refactoring, I try to add a test to check that my, my <coughs> the behavior I'm, potentially affecting here is that it's working before and that it work, it's working after my refactoring. Um, whenever I make a change to the code, I try to put a test in place to, to test the behavior I want to have after the change so that I know that I haven't, uh, that, uh, that it works and that it won't, that will continue to work uh, further down the road. And also when fixing a bug, it's useful to try to, to get a test in place which so shows the bug you fix the bug, the test goes green, and you will never again have the bug as long as you have you run your test suite, um, which is then, of course, a prerequisite. So I have one last slide. Uh, it's just a lot of uh, small advice, uh, what has worked for me. Um, and after that, we can, we can wrap up with some discussion. But just going to run through this one. So, uh, in general, I think uh, user interfaces, I didn't touch on them much, but they, they should be kept as simple as possible, as James, James uh, uh, went through at length yesterday. And uh, uh, the, the, I, I, I don't try to, to t unit test my user interfaces, that I do by hand, but then what's called by the user interfaces is typically some kind of cohesive module, and that's then tested. Uh, don't marry a framework. Uh, by that I mean that you shouldn't, your code shouldn't be calling the framework, it should be the other way around, so that uh, the code that you develop that you have under test can be run without the framework, uh, you can test it without the framework, then you plug it into the framework and you have the framework call your code. Uh, that's how I tend to set up the dependencies. Um, private VIs, um, there's been a lot of discussion about this on the internet, should you test them and how. Um, I think it's, uh, they should be tested but through the public interfaces. If you can't access them through a public interface, then it's just dead code that doesn't do anything anyway. So you should just be able to delete that. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and if it's a, a state, a VI cannot be called in through the public user interface, then it doesn't really make sense to test that either. If you feel that you really have to test the private VI because it's uh, so well, it's key for some reason, then this is really the, uh, a clue that you should maybe try to break out the subclass, make a, because it tends to, to point to the situation where where the, the the module, the unit of code, tries to do more than one thing, and the, the other thing is buried deep within private VIs. So it's typically a sign that you want to split something out. Um, yeah, uh, it's important. I talked about cycle times on the order of minutes, and uh, one uh, one useful thing is to to keep to make a separate compile and commit suite so that you have one which you run when you uh, whenever you compile. <laughs> that's when you um, work with your code when you uh, want to see that it works, <coughs> and you, then you have a separate suite which, which you can you can have in your CI system to to continuously run. Um, yeah, I talked a lot about testing behavior, and uh, you should try to test that the code does what it's supposed to do, not that it's written in a certain way. Um, 
and this is uh, something to keep in the back of the head when, when writing tests, it's uh, just to, to be, be aware of. Uh, this is actually surprised me a lot of times that when I write a test, I run it and it passes and I'm like, how, how could this, this pass? And usually it's some bug in my test, I make mistakes as anyone else. So uh, it's a, a good idea. It, it might sound dogmatic, but this idea of seeing the test fail is actually very, very powerful. And it tells you that the test actually tests something useful. Um, yeah, there is this, I already touched on this, but uh, this mantra that you don't write any production code before writing the tests. In lab, this is a bit difficult since you can't call VIs, that doesn't exist. So uh, I tend to not write any block diagram code before I have uh, tests for that block diagram. Um, avoid writing more than one test at a time. Yeah, um, it's it's easier to think at one, uh, about one thing at a time, to focus on a single thing, uh, and it tends to, the result tend to be better when we, uh, when we break down problems into many small pieces which we solve sequentially, not in parallel. And also, <laughs> the, the few times I tried to write many tests, I have like a parameter list and I want to test all the parameters, and then I write like five tests. Then I realize after I test the first that, yeah, I actually need to do it in a different way, and uh, that's when I need to start over. Um, yeah. And yeah, you can add, in most of these frameworks, you can add manual descriptions, uh, but since a lot of the tests are starting from an old test, these tend to live, live like ghost comments that uh, are very, have a very short time frame where they, where, where they are accurate. So I tend to leave those out and have, have the, the auto-generated ones are fine, but uh, I don't use a lot of manual descriptions. Um, yeah, also make the tests, we only test one thing. Um, it makes it makes it easier to reason about, and also if it fails, you know why it failed, uh, not that it's one out of a set of things which might have failed. Set up teardowns uh, in uh, X-unit style testing frameworks, so that's VI tester or L-unit. Uh, you have the setup and teardown methods. Uh, th these are separate VIs, so it's a bit confusing to do a lot of stuff in them because you won't see it at the same time as you see the rest of the code. So I tend to not uh, put anything that's important for the test in the setup, so I keep that as a sub-VI in, in the test cases instead. And in the setup tear down there, I can clean up after myself, delete files, generate file, name, file names or something like that. Uh, yeah, LUnit supports running multiple test runners in parallel. This can significantly reduce the test time, uh, and this is, again, important because the t workflow needs this fast feedback, so you need to have the test running in seconds. And uh, yeah, then enable this parallel ex execution is, uh, is very useful. And additionally, also you will, uh, you will pretty soon uh, feel the pain of not having thread safe code if you try to run your <laughs> tests in parallel. So this is another benefit that you get out of it. It's a bit difficult to debug because you won't necessarily know. It's a bit undeterministic as parallel uh, processing tend to be. And yeah, there's a lot of, uh, on the, the in books and on the internet about using files for tests. Uh, because, and the, the reason why it's uh, considered a bad practice is because it's slow. Nowadays we have fast SSDs, so I wouldn't optimize for speed before I really need to. So um, yeah, that was maybe my last point. Yeah, everything is available uh, on the, the GitHub if you want to discuss more with me I'll stay until tomorrow morning here. You can also reach me on LinkedIn. Just mention that you saw me here in the presentation. I will gladly accept. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we have one minute and 30 seconds for, for question and discussion. <laughs> Command and a question. I found something that worked very well for me. Is uh, so yeah, write the test first, and uh, have someone else than you write the test. Someone that knows the less as possible as what you are doing. And basically, I create the VI that is the unit under test. I put the description of what it should do, and then I give that to the developer and write the unit test. All what you have is inputs, outputs, description. And you not only test your code, but you also test your 
documentation of the code. And I found that one very well. Yeah, thanks. It's a good, good input. Um, I would argue that, for me, that wouldn't work, because uh, I talked about the cycle time needs to be fast. And I can't say to write down a specification, write this test for me, and then wait for someone to do it and get back to it. So in my workload, that wouldn't work. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sure, exactly. Uh, and you need to find what works for you. Uh, but for, for, for me and for this kind of uh, fast iterative development, it wouldn't work to have someone else write the, the unit tests for you. So, so these are not like the traditional style unit tests that you might have in, well, let's say older books, there's a lot of this. You heard about the, the unit tester, uh, the tester walking into the bar, he orders a beer, he orders 100 beers, minus one beer, then a million beers, the infinite amount of beers. And then a customer comes and uh, orders a hamburger and everything just bursts into flame. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so, I mean, the, the mindset is completely different. I'm not trying to test every possible uh, path through the system. I'm trying to, well, test the likely ones. Thank you.